you know, you start making uh, amusement parks, put a plexiglass wall between a trainer and a dolphin, and pretty soon uh, you're going to be telling me children can't volunteer to be loggers. <laughs> 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 I mean, I mean, like, what are you, what are you going to tell me that uh, that's a 14 hour work day is illegal now? <laughs> Best-named legal podcast. I am your host, Charles Star. Uh, All-star panel with us this week. Uh, everyone, please say hello to Rich Lather. Uh, hi, I'm Rich Lather. <laughs> uh, and back again uh, is Christina. Hey, guys. And uh, long time no speak. Welcome back, Michael. Hey, good, be to, good to be back. Uh, good to have you. So uh, you are back just in time. Uh, we have another uh, Supreme Courty kind of episode because uh, since the end of the term, which we took a depressing dump on in episode seventeen, uh, it's only gotten worse. <laughs> only ever, <laughs> it only ever gets worse, and the specific way in which it has gotten worse now is that uh, Neil Gorsuch's high school classmate. <laughs> Uh, for real, how is that a thing that's true? But it is true. Uh, his his classmate and his co clerk, co clerk for the retired Justice Kennedy, uh, Brett Kavanaugh of the District of Columbia Circuit Court of Appeals, has been nominated to take the place of the uh, retired and <laughs> somehow we're going to end up missing him, Anthony Kennedy. Um, Coward. Who I. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. Yes. That's exactly Absolutely. right. He was afraid. He was afraid to uh, make. He was afraid to make any good ruling uh, he ever had uh, stand for any longer than he was literally on the court. <laughs> and yeah. so he is gone and will soon be forgotten. Um, so, so Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, is uh is an originalist and a textualist and uh a cretin so uh does anyone want to put some meat on those bones well that's it uh, we could just finish now you got it charles <laughs> done one one observation you know the good thing about this guy is um you can dress him up in a originalist or whatever kind of you know uh framing you want um, he is a political creature through and through, right? I mean, yes. this guy started his career uh, in on, on like the Gore or the Bush recount team, right? In two thousand or something. And oh, was, he started earlier than that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah he no, was. On, he, start, he, he started. Star. He started with Clinton, right? Or something. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. He was on the. He was on the. Ken. He was one of Ken Starr's. Um, he was on the Ken Starr Independent Council. Yeah. Team. He wanted to ask right. the president if he jacked off into a trash can. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I got to I got to say, uh, <laughs> I'm going to defend that question. <laughs> the uh, what happened? I mean, to me, the clear backstory here, the number one is that uh, I guess the internal debate on Ken Starr's independent counsel team was how aggressive to be with uh, Bill Clinton when they were taking his deposition or his voluntary statement or however they ended up phrasing not it. Not jacking him because, off, just to be clear. Right, not jacking him off. They were not going to jack they Because he, they were going to treat him as a hostile witness. So even if they were a <laughs> So, um, 
So, so the background. Look, you can't set that up and not expect it to go further. And let's not get into the <laughs> dry jacking <laughs> debate here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, so, all right. Uh, so, to me, the background is clearly they had asked Monica Lewinsky in excruciating detail about the sexual uh, relations she had with uh, the president. And she said he did this and then he would finish in the trash can and he (laughs) used a cigar and he like she listed all of these things. And so they what Kavanaugh's position was, is that he expected Clinton to be incredibly weaselly, as it turned out, he was right. Depends on the meaning of is it depends on the meaning of sex. Like he he expected Clinton to evade all sorts of questions. So in this case, he's a litigator. Right. And he's like, well, I'm taking a deposition of a guy. We have the factual testimony of the of the person who he we think he perjured himself about. And so we can't ask general questions so he can give evasive denials and then claim that our questions were not specific enough. So we have to ask specific questions. And so all of the gross things he wanted to ask, I think, were almost certainly verbatim from Monica Lewinsky's testimony before the independent counsel's team. And so he's just like, look, we have specific things to ask him about and we should make him. Uh, admit or deny these specific yeah. things. And then the one thing that Ken Starr, he was like, oh, that's a little far, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so Ken Starr actually pulled back on the reins on that and I think was much more general in the questions that he asked. And then he put all of Lewinsky's verbatim testimony into the Starr report. Right. Right. And, right. And so he didn't put it in the dep. He didn't ask the questions at the deposition, but then he released all of that information anyway. And Kavanaugh didn't think that Starr should do that. Right. So he so he actually was a conscientious litigator and more of a prude. Than Ken Starr well, but, was because he thought it was insulting to Lewinsky to detail all of like the se- the specific sexual activity. Well, I, I'm not I'm not necessarily condemning him for this line of inquiry at all. But I mean, the fact is he wanted to. The, the question was whether or not to be um, somewhat circumspect to you know avoid embarrassing the man or whether they wanted to rake him over the coals, right and the memo that he circulated was saying that, you know, basically this guy either needs to resign or confess and apologize to you, Ken Starr. Uh, He's disgraced the (laughs) office. Uh, His disgusting behavior uh, has ruined the life of a 22 year old intern, which is probably one of the few good opinions uh, uh, Kavanaugh has had in his life. Right. Um, But then wanted to go on and ask him. So, uh, when Monica Lewinsky says you ejaculated into her mouth on two occasions in the Oval Office, would she be lying? You know, <laughs> if she says you jerked off into a sink, would she be lying? You know, and and I, I don't know whether that's a more effective line of questioning in this case or not. Right. Um, it's yeah, it's yeah. clear that the guy. But the, but the point being, uh, even though I got my timeline all fucked up, the point being that this guy started off as an extraordinarily political animal. Uh, and I don't think he's far from that uh, acorn uh, today. Well, well yeah. what's really fascinating is the turn he's taken in terms of like uh, how he views the powers as the president. So he was he was on this team that basically, you know, wanted to rake Clinton over the coals for the Lewinsky stuff. And then he was like a personal, not personal secretary, but like he was personally involved in the the Bush uh, presidency, like the Bush executive team. And then he goes on to write this, like, I mean, truly insane law review article for, uh, actually the law review that I am alumnus of, uh, the Minnesota law review, where he basically says that the president should be above the law. And I base this on my past as being someone who questioned the president. Like, I mean, it goes, it goes really into detail about how uh, basically he wants to take a shit on the separation of powers. Like he does not think that the president should be subject to criminal or civil investigation, subpoenas, um, depositions or anything while he's sitting as a president. 
Now, I didn't read the Law yeah. Review article, but is it the case that he's saying that he now believes in retrospect um, that prosecuting Clinton or, or this investigation against Clinton prevented Clinton from doing his job? Yes, he literally says there's this. It's an amazing article. Everyone should read it. Yeah. Uh, at, at one point, he says that, like, maybe if uh, President Clinton had been so worried about Paula Jones, we could have done something about uh, Osama bin Laden. <laughs> right. So he, he's yes. saying that, extremely like, fair he, point. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. could have avoided 9-11. I, 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 I appreciate him taking his share of the blame for 9-11. That's, you know. <laughs> so basically Trump's Trump's nominee did 9-11. That's what we've concluded. Yeah, yeah. That's, 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 yeah. That's, and I think he should be asked about that. He was he was the, the 19th. The 20th. Uh, the 19th driver. The 20th hijacker. 20th hijacker. It's hard to um, read something like this and not think, like, you know, how how is this is going to personally benefit President Trump? Well, well, I think one of the I think one of the fun. Well, though, he wrote this. He wrote the article back in. He wrote it a long 2008, time ago, not I that think. long ago. Yeah, but long enough ago that he wasn't thinking. Well, about no, President of course Trump. not. Because he's <laughs> so, the one who only cares um, about I mean, separation of powers whenever the, there's a uh, Democratic president who's seated. I mean, we can see that from his dissents. Right. Well, but what I'm saying is he published an article in 2008 on the verge of the like, was it on the verge of the Obama presidency or during the Obama presidency where he was giving this like I, he was basically saying that Obama shouldn't be uh, subject to any of this stuff. But one right. of the things that I think is interesting is he finds vindication for his view or support for his view in any event. Back when uh Back when Morrison v. Olson was decided, and I think during Star also, there was an independent counsel statute. What's more, what's Certainly, Morrison v. Olson again? I'm sorry. Morrison, Morrison, Morrison v. Olson was uh, when Ted Olson, the uh, he is now the conservative uh, litigation superstar. Uh, I think he's at Gibson Dunn now, uh, but he was like he was one of the he was he was on the he was on the Bush v. Gore litigation team but his like his moment of resistance vindication was i think he was also with david david boys on the windsor the gay marriage yeah the windsor litigation mm -hmm. um but at the time he was i think reagan's solicitor general yeah, solicitor uh yeah, and so yeah he was the he was the solicitor general under i think reagan maybe bush but the first Bush, uh, but he got he got charged with something. And I don't even remember the details of what the investigation of him was. But he objected to the independent counsel statute on separation of powers grounds that the the creation of an ind like an, a, a prosecutor who wasn't under the control of the executive prosecuting the executive created separation of powers concerns. And I believe it was either seven one or eight one. But Scalia wrote the dissent yeah. in that case, and all of the conservative legal establishment essentially considers the Scalia dissent uh, a kind of majority opinion yeah. Yeah. because it is the it is their guidepost. <laughs> it is their guidepost for all separation of powers arguments on this, and they and. The, the the independent counsel statute itself had a sunset clause, and when it came up for renewal, Congress did not renew it, and so right. that is not what Robert what uh, what Robert Mueller is operating under. He is he is within the Justice Department. He is a special prosecutor within the executive branch and controlled by the Attorney General, or in this case, the Assistant Attorney General, but. Because of uh, because of Sessions recusal, but the statute itself doesn't exist anymore because Congress ended up agreeing with the Scalia dissent because they were in the crosshairs. Right. Right. And so the statute. And so he thinks that he thinks that the basic argument of uh, the Scalia dissent applies on policy grounds more broadly to any prosecution or civil suit against the president, which would mean he'd be going against the eight zero Clinton v. Jones 
decision too. Right. Because in that case, the one that sort of prompted everything was the case that allowed the Paula Jones civil suit and all of those depositions to go forward. And the Supreme Court said, no, of course you have to sit for that deposition. Right. It didn't right. happen while you were president. And so you're you have to answer like normal legal process in the civil law. And so he he would uh, vote against that, though I don't think he'd get any support for it. Right. And, you know, I'll add that um, he takes that principle even further and, uh, you know, has suggested that he doesn't think any independent agencies, not just the independent counsel, but, you know, like uh, CFPB. <clears throat> Yeah, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, yeah, any what, independent what are other regulatory ones? body. Uh, He's is just it like, Fuck the em. EPA, I think, independent as well? Um, there's a whole list of them. But yeah, he would he would just eliminate, he wouldn't eliminate the agencies, but he'd eliminate their independence and, and bring them all fully within the executive branch. So like the Federal Reserve would, you know, the chair of the Fed would be fireable at will if, you know, the president yeah. doesn't like where interest rates are at. Um yeah. Which is, you know, sort of inviting, politicizing a lot of tough policy issues. Yeah. And I mean, in this case, I guess the the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Board is a, like this was the sole head of the agency and point appointed to like a 15 year term. Right. The the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC commissioners are appointed for a term of years, though not a single one. And that extends past the president's term. The NLRB right. is the same way. There are a lot of commissions like this. And and yeah. the D.C. Circuit, actually, and I don't remember if I think Kavanaugh was one of the people who voted on this, who ruled, found that the structure of the CFPB was unconstitutional yeah. because Cordray was a sole commissioner. Right. right. And he and he distinguished it because the SEC had faced the same argument. Right. And the and at least back, I think it was like back in the 30s. Uh, so the Supreme Court had found that the structure was constitutional uh, because there were multiple commissioners. And, you know, like but the modern the modern reading at the very least distinguished the CFPB because it was a single commissioner with that right. vested authority. Right. Yeah. The rationale is um, independent agencies might not be accountable to the president um, the way, you know, executive agencies are, but the uh, board members are accountable to each other. Right. right. And and um, I mean, and the accountability yeah. question is a little attenuated, right? right. They are like the executive for for the purposes of the unitary executive, you want the officials to be accountable to the president. And the right. reason you want them to be accountable to the president is because the president was duly elected and is himself accountable right. to the citizens of the country. And so like, that's the kind of constitutional theory that goes underneath it. Like the entire administrative state is staffed with people who weren't elected. And so if you have these unelected people making decisions, which is why he, constantly undermines every uh, executive agency <laughs> right. he can at every right. turn. Yes. Um, so yeah. spe speaking of which, do we want to discuss uh, undermining or trying to undermine, uh, you know, when, what is it, OSHA tries to regulate <laughs> SeaWorld? Yeah, yeah, we might as well, we might as well start with a fun one. Uh, do you want, does, that, does someone else want to give the background on this? Or I can, either way. Um, Michael, I, Michael, I can, go for it. Uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, you guys can jump in whenever you want. Seize, seize the day. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're responsible yeah. for all great water-based uh, anecdotes. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the facts of this, which is, um, you know, the, this all revolved around a question of whether or not SeaWorld was essentially in compliance with federal safety regulations um in regards to their killer whale shows um and the facts were <laughs> that a trainer during a show uh was lying on her back uh i think a little bit above the, the pool where the killer whale was um sort of giving it a cue that it was supposed to do i think like a, a 
some sort of backflip or belly flop or something like that. And instead of doing what it was trained to do, it uh, grabbed her and pulled her under the water and ultimately uh, killed her, which is pretty much about as bad uh, a SeaWorld experience as I think you can, you can get as an audience yes. member. <laughs> and, and, as a, and as a workplace accident, a pretty terrible yeah. outcome. Was, this, was so, this the Blackfish one? Like, was this the... Uh, I think Tilikum so. Or I think, so yeah. Tilikum, yeah. yeah, Tilikum. Um, I believe so. And, and so, uh, you know, the question was whether or not there was this, there weren't any specific regulations uh, in this <laughs> sort of area, but there was a general duty that, that workplaces have. Um, to not let their employees a, get eaten by a whale. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and so the question was whether or not this... Uh, <laughs> The general duty applies here, and uh, Kavanaugh was was certain, <laughs> certain that uh, it did not, because, yeah. um, you know, if you don't prevent if you have to prevent killer whales from from killing trainers and you also have to prevent football players from tackling each other apparently yeah, yeah. that was Wait, like we're going to we're going to get a little <laughs> we're going to get a little ahead of ourselves but that was the crux of his opinion that was the crux but, of his ar- argument though it was it, but, as extremely weak but i yeah. just i want to point out so osha osha investigates right because it's a workplace accident they come in they look over everything they interview everyone they review the training manuals and all of that and the the hammer the hammer that osha drops on sea world after this investigation <laughs> is 70, a seventy thousand dollar fine yeah it's all your work sea world sea world finds them seventy thousand dollars which is less than the cost of printing their briefs in the dc court of appeals <laughs> right yeah. this is how much they don't want to be regulated by osha but so so they get fined seventy thousand dollars and they they protest and they protest on a lot of grounds right the one that gets kavanaugh really mad is the scope of the Department of Labor's authority That's to right. regulate yep. under OSHA. Right. But I want to pause for a second to say that one of their defenses was that they weren't aware that killer whales were dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> right. They claimed they claimed killer that whales. with their with their eyes, they, 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 they thought it was an quotes. ironic name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, this and, and it was Tillicum had had killed another trainer, right? Yes. In like nineteen ninety one. Yes. Um and as a result they had already taken some sort of like measures where I think they weren't um the trainers did less sort of hands on work. No, with- that was after the second. Oh, that was after after the second <laughs> that was, death. That was yeah. after kill- Tillicum care- yeah. killed again as he swore he would. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, he when he was in a when he was in a whale show at some in like uh, Spain in Spain, yeah, in Spain. I uh, killed a night. But I mean, one of the things it says in the record, based on evidence regarding three previous deaths involving killer whales beginning in 1991 with Tillicum. Right. But they said that, like, between our operant conditioning and the other safety measures we took, we didn't think it was dangerous and we weren't on notice. Right. It says the ALJ, but the ALJ concluded that it uh The ALJ concluded that SeaWorld's claim that it was unaware working with killer whales presents a recognized hazard (laughs) is difficult to reconcile with numerous comments made over the years by SeaWorld management personnel, (laughs) including two corporate curators of animal training whose comments were documented and circulated among all of the SeaWorld parks. Right. So they did a serious investigation before they find them. And they were like, you know, they're dangerous. Once Tillicum killed this trainer, you instituted safety protocols for all of the whales and specific double safety protocols with Tillicum. And so all we're saying is you got to pay a $70,000 fine and keep doing the stuff that you did right. after 
Tilikum Kilt. No more your trainer. What, what was it? Wet work, right? Is no that- more. Yeah, they distinguish between dry work and wet work, <laughs> or yeah. not wet work. Wet work is what that's murder. They call mafia. That's that's mafia murder. Murder. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Black ops. <laughs> right. No, they did dry work and water work. Water ah. work. Water work. Um, yeah, right. right. Which is what Al Pacino does. Um, <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that, that yeah, reference sorry. is going to go over anyone's head who is. Uh, yeah, no, below the I age know. Of- but that that reference is older. That movie is older than me. Too. Uh-huh, so sure. uh, not literally older than me, but I wasn't allowed to watch it when it came <laughs> out. I don't know where uh, we that's are. Cru- this, so. That's that's cruising, which is a terrible, terrible Al Pacino movie about the uh, murderous gay underworld of New York. I'm going to cut this out. He was an undercover cop. <laughs> so in any event they have dry work is when the trainers are like on or near the podiums and mm. water work is when they're like swimming with the dolphins right and uh the killer whale acts were always dry work right um like even in this one though she seemed like she was like partially in the water like i think right. the platform was actually like the platform was like a few inches below the surface of the water. Right. Yeah, so she was lying in the pool. And there's no but barrier. Not swimming. And right. so that was one of OSHA's things was, well, put a barrier up, if, you know, yeah. and, and, which is reasonable. Yeah. yeah. Um, but. And so and so then we get to their the defense that Kavanaugh found very compelling is that OSHA's got a lot of statutes, right? A lot of them are very specific things like. Uh, putting glowing yellow railing, mm. r- yellow markers, even mm. at the Tesla plant uh, in your factories and railings and the width of aisles and right. forms of egress and fire escapes, like tons of really specific, like factory specs and safety requirements. But they also just have what Michael said before, they have a general duty clause, which is you have a general duty as the employer to keep yourself, to keep your uh, employees safe and to keep the working conditions safe. And so the way they find him was they were like, look, you will not be surprised that we don't have killer whale regs. <laughs> but but we think that if you are operating a show involving killer whales, you have to make it safe for the people working with the killer whales and you didn't do it. And the subsequent actions that you have taken proves that you could have done it. Right. right. And so you are fined seventy thousand dollars and you have to make these permanent changes. And SeaWorld fought that and Kavanaugh like completely blew a gasket. He was it's like, tyranny. Uh, it's tyranny. like the, his yeah. his descent was so pissy. He was just like yeah, he was, it was just like the first paragraph was just talking about how like uh dealing with killer whales is much like the sport of ice hockey. And I'm just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he he really goes on about like uh, where will it stop if we regulate killer whales? <laughs> slippery slope. What's next? Um, killer whales, yeah. the slippery fins. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and well, one of the and and their big argument was this case Pelron. This was SeaWorld's argument. It was this case Pelron, where this company that makes hazardous chemicals, right? That's mm-hmm. literally their job. They make right. hazardous chemicals for industrial applications or something. And OSHA find them because they were like, well, this could result in a buildup of hazardous chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, they eventually they were like, that's what the ALJ said. And then like the Department of Labor, o- Labor overruled the ALJ because they're like, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, you can find them if this shit blows up or if someone dies, but their business is literally making these chemicals. And so right. the presence of the potential buildup of these chemicals can't be the violation or you're saying the entire industry is illegal. It's right. a feature. Right. Not and a so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so they're like, this is the rule. And SeaWorld's like, see, that's us. <laughs> If like if we can't like have killer whales in a position where they might kill someone, what are we even doing here? Sea- SeaWorld's running a, a live snuff film business right. model. <laughs> right. And so then and so Kavanaugh picks up that baton and yeah. he says, 
absolutely true. It's the same as tackling in football or crashes in NASCAR. And they assume, like the people who are trainers at SeaWorld, just like these professional athletes, assume the risk of their chosen profession. Right. right. They go into this doing uh this this dangerous activity of working with killer whales is just like playing professional football and they assume the risk of what they're doing because just like the performance of football is the product the performance of whale killer whale shows is the product at sea world and so uh and so the uh the trainers at sea world are just like uh, professional. I have to athletes. say, when you put it that way, that I that sounds much better than his like pissy little descent. I'm like, okay, yeah, but, <laughs> but it's but it's still it's still it's wrong. So wrong. And, and I, it's still wrong. You can still have killer whale shows and just have the trainers, you know, somewhat, you know, segregated from the whales as SeaWorld was already doing. Like that's SeaWorld's business model continued to run without having, you know. I don't think. Do the, I don't think they do them work. anymore, do they? Well, they do, but they don't interact. Oh. I think they right. still it's dry, do. Like it's dry work, not wet work. It's, yeah. it's dry work, not, I, not wet yeah, work. I can't, I <laughs> can't, you know, I can't be the only one who thinks that uh, if the troops wanted to, they, they couldn't get uh, together and really train the shit out of some killer whales. <laughs> yes, but they would train them yeah, to kill again. Exactly. <laughs> they would, we, would have, we would have the most aggressive naval whale force. <laughs> Um, but I, I, well, but there are there are a couple of responses, Christina. One of them is, and this was in the majority. This was in the majority opinion. The Sea World very specifically disclaimed the fact that the element of danger was right. was important to the show, which they literally, which they had to do. Right. I mean, could you imagine if there, if Eugene Scalia got up at oral argument? He's like, "Look, Your Honor, this." It's very important that the uh, audience thinks this person is going to die. I mean, I would pay more that. And you, that. You, can't, you can't fake it, Your Honor. Yeah. This, this person really must almost die every time. And so they disclaimed it. They're like, that's right. actually not part. The element of the trainer dying is not part of the show, and, and which it most yeah. certainly is in NASCAR. And, and the majority also had a good point, which is that SeaWorld is not like the NFL. It's like Disney World, it's like carnivals, it's like other entertainment, you know, industry parks and, and that sort of thing. And uh, OSHA has regulated those for a long yeah. time. You know, and that's there's like a long you know history of them yeah. doing stuff like that. So it's it's just very unpersuasive. Um, you take and tackling out of football and it's not football. But if you remove the trainer from the tank, you can still do cool tricks with the whales and the dolphins. Yeah. And I think one of the more important things uh, is the point of OSHA. And this is a point that the majority makes a lot is that it's not waivable. <laughs> right. Right. It is a duty you put on the employer to keep your employees safe. You yeah. can't tell a miner to go into the mine without an oxygen tank and the miner goes, ah, well, OK, right? <laughs> right. Like, that's it. You can't like they have to, you know, if you work in a plant, you have to wear safety goggles and you have to wear like if you're in a slaughterhouse, you have to wear like the thick canvas vest so that the blade doesn't doesn't cut through your torso and all like yeah. safety equipment and OSHA responsibilities are literally the employer's responsibilities. And the, the employees are not allowed to assume the risk that the law otherwise puts on the employer. Right. Well, right. And, you know, I don't think this was in the constitution, which is all he cares about. So. <laughs> right. No, he doesn't, he doesn't make it a constitution. <laughs> Fortunately, fortunately he sticks to it being, he sticks to it being a statutory claim, but in the nature of his usual statutory interpretation, he doesn't want to extend the general duty clause very far. Right. And so, and so he just wants to really limit it and exclude all of these kind of entertainment, sort of things 
you know, he's like, what are you, what are you going to do next to make uh, boxers play tic-tac-toe? Right. Hey. <laughs> you know, like, hey, it's ridiculous. <laughs> You know, and so and so he tries to distinguish all of he tries to distinguish all of it. But it basically comes down to the fact that he thinks that uh, the whale show is uh, is professional sports. Right. And it's uh, untenable and ridiculous. And it's just because he wants to cut the legs out of the department. Okay, can we take like a five, right. five second break? I'm, I'm going to move to the to another room. Okay, I'm so sure. sorry. Brand new statement. I have your gaping open. Check it out, y'all. Now let's see. Deltron Z. Art Avenger. Let's start the adventure. Pitch up with nerve gas. Absurd blast. Crash the spacecraft. I'm bio enhanced. Pyro Advanced Series. Monstrous evolution. Headed to the nail. Super trail. Super sleuth. A new race. Mad creator. Savage nature. Uh, all right. Uh, so anyone, anyone further thoughts on SeaWorld? Because I have further thoughts on how much he hates workers. Well, this seems like a good place to dovetail. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the I mean the other the other one uh that I wanted to talk about was the Verizon versus the NLRB uh which was a case he was actually uh in the majority uh for this one which was very frustrating. A, a union had signed a no picketing order and uh and so the union had agreed that they wouldn't picket the employer. And so they kind of backdoored it, right? Like when they drove to work in the morning, they had a bunch of their employees uh, park their cars backed up to the fence, which faced the street. And then they put signs in their rear windows, <laughs> um, like pro union and like bargain with us and other like uh, degrees of varying aggressiveness. And they just parked their cars and then they went to work and they didn't pick it, but they left in their cars these messages that uh, were anti management and pro union. And so Verizon filed an unfair labor practice charge. They filed a grievance with the National Labor Relations Board, and the ALJ agreed with them and said no this is picketing you know you can't uh you can't sort of screw your employer uh like this and the nlrb reversed and said uh no it's not picketing picketing is picketing it's like actually obstructing people from entering the workplace or otherwise uh you know getting in the way and uh and so he then he said, no, it's actually picketing. <laughs> like it, and so he reversed the NLRB, even though it's supposed to be like a really deferential That's standard. Right. Yeah. And he just was like, ah, he, even, he ah. Like talked about how deferential it was know? supposed to be while like taking a giant shit on it and wiping it with his ass. Like, I mean, like it, it was mm. incredible. Yeah. It, um, he, I mean, mostly it goes to his like basic feeling of statutory interpretation. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is where we get into the weeds of administrative law and Chevron. And Chevron is just this series, this kind of it's a case, kind of a serious like a case that bounced up and down to the Supreme Court a bunch of times. But the basic argument of Chevron is that when a statute gives regulatory authority to a federal agency. And the authority, the grant of authority is ambiguous. Courts will defer to the agency's agency own interpretation of that grant. Right. So the agency right. usually wins. If it's ambiguous, the agency wins. And the entire Kavanaugh theory is that nothing is ambiguous. He hates agency. And therefore, the agency always loses when they try to regulate anything. Yeah. Because no matter what the agency tried to do, it almost certainly wasn't the literal text of what Congress said. <laughs> right. And, and so uh, and so the fact that uh, this the fact that uh, the agency's grant wasn't broad enough. And so they were just like, no, this is we I think 
that the contract says no picketing. And since I, Brett Kavanaugh, supreme interpreter of the language of English, (laughs) uh, believe that the signs in the rear window are pickets, the contract itself was unambiguous and the NLRB should have followed the contract. And therefore, uh, this was an unfair labor practice. Well, it's just, it's just just like, you know, nothing, nothing pisses uh, these guys off more than, you know, labor pulling off a good trick, right? I mean, they've they've figured out a way to basically force labor into uh, you know, a small area cordoned off by barricades, walking around in a circle with a bunch of signs, right? Um, and here they agreed not to do that. So any kind of creative uh, organizing efforts uh, were obviously going to be met with uh, extreme hostility by these folks. Yeah, right. Yep. And I think one of the funnier things about this case is how deference just sort of plays back and forth constantly. Right. I mean, what happens is like a panel rules in favor of Verizon and then an ALJ, like an arbitrator's panel rules in favor of Verizon. Then an ALJ who hears the appeal rules in favor of Verizon and then the NLRB reverses. And then Kavanaugh reverses. And one of the reasons that Kavanaugh and one of the and Henderson concurring uh, is they say that the NLRB is supposed to have like a deferential standard of review from the ALJ. (laughs) And they're like, look, the NLR, the ALJ said it was picketing and the NLRB is supposed to be deferential. And so their failure to be deferential was wrong. And so we're reversing them on that ground too. Right. Right. The concurrence is like, you shouldn't have been deferential because they were supposed to be in warrant. And uh, Srinivasan, who was almost uh, nominated when Garland was nominated, uh, Srinivasan, like, was like, ah. No, what? <laughs> no, that part's crazy. Um, like, and he basically, he basically was like, "Look, I concur in your your standard about like legal arguments, and so uh, we're supposed to be defer. Like, they're supposed to be deferential, and we're supposed to be deferential, and so we really shouldn't be reversing them here because." Like if the NLRB doesn't want to consider signs in the back of a car picketing, we shouldn't be making that decision. Right. Like that is definitely within their grant. And this sort of backdoor way of saying the NLRB is supposed to be following the ALJ is kind of dirty pool and dumb. And I just want to like I would just want to point out how inefficient the court system is. The decision in the D.C. Circuit was eight was in June of 2016. The parking was in 2008. (laughs) It took eight years of arbitrators decisions and NLRB decisions all the way up to the circuit court. It took eight years. All of those people have been fired for union activity already. <laughs> and and this case was just getting all, all all about whether or not a worker can put um, a sign saying his boss sucks in his own car. Right. Right. Eight years of eight years of legal wrangling. You know, one thing one thing about these cases, it's really hard to draw a straight line through um, these people's understanding of how executive power is supposed to be wielded. I mean, these are Article One agencies, right? These are these are presidential agencies, uh, in a sense, mm-hmm. or executive branch agencies. Um, anytime they exercise any kind of authority over a business, that's bad. But by the same token, I think this guy also believes a president should have untrammeled authority to do whatever he wants, right? So I, I just yeah. it's so hard for me to figure out what the consistent analytical approach is from these folks. Well, I think it's pretty clear. I mean, like it's Republican it, it, president. It, it, good. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Bad? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's it. To me, it's obvious. I mean, that's how that's how a lot of these originalists are. And you can see it in his opinions when he like, you know, gives lip service to precedence and, and deference. But really, he's just going to do whatever he wants that serves his own political agenda. Right. Though, though the political agenda is less regulation. 
And one of the ways to get less regulation is to kneecap executive agencies, right? Like the yeah. the the whole administrative state is kind of anathema to conservative yeah. governance philosophy. Absolutely. Where they're just like, look, Congress should just be passing statutes and they shouldn't be kicking it down to these agencies. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, I think most people are like, Congress can't fucking do anything can you imagine and if like, congress had to pass a law every time they wanted to like change the interest rate like the fed does like that right for or just yeah change you know admission standards like it would i mean that's right. the idea is none of that ever would get yeah. done and and the government would yeah. shrink yeah. tremendously yeah. yeah i mean but there's we have like over like a hundred years of this Right. Like the federal government and the use of the agency structure is now really, really embedded in the way the country works. And the fact that they keep fighting to just completely neuter all of the regulatory state. And I mean, that's one of the things in like I read a he wrote a book review of uh, Robert Katzman's book on statutes. And Katzman is a Second Circuit judge. And one of the things that he admits in the book review is he knows that Congress can't pass anything, number right. one, right. right? He knows that they intentionally write ambiguous statutes to get and them kick passed. the responsibility, yeah, yeah to get yeah. them passed and to kick the responsibility to the agency. And it's like everyone in government and the, the president signs these ambiguous statutes. And so all of the actual governing parts of government agree that this is the only way that government can work, right? Right. We have this administrative state. We have these regulatory bodies. We write broad grants of authority to them and expect them through notice and comment rulemaking to do the actual legwork of making this functional for the people in the regulated industries. And guys like Kavanaugh and Scalia and this, and it'll definitely be Gorsuch and this whole Mm -hmm. sort of body of law is to just be like, yeah, but what if all of that was illegal? What if like (laughs) the entire way we've chosen to govern ourselves for the last hundred years actually doesn't count and it would be better for me because I went to good schools uh, to just erase <laughs> all of it. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't think any of this is ambiguous. Well, but it's not just, it's yeah. not just how mean, government runs. I mean, reading. this is how companies run. I mean, there is a delegation of authority at some point, uh, you know, if you want to get anything done. I mean, this is not that right. complicated. The president can't make every goddamn decision. Um, we, we're not France. We're not a code state. We're not California with, with 175,000 parts to our, you know, safety laws, et cetera. Like, we, we, you need to yeah. have some flexibility in order to govern. And these folks just believe governing itself is bad, except when you're surveilling people or, or jailing them, I guess. Yeah, right. I mean, you're, you're right. making the assumption right. here that he cares about the government running or that he— or But he obviously he does. He anything. obviously does when it's the troops or whatever. I mean, like, this is what I don't— I guess I guess they believe that there are two or three valid functions of government and the rest is invalid. I, I don't. Yes, which is I right. Yes, I do. I do think they believe that. <laughs> I think that's yeah. pretty clear. And, yeah. and specifically, he's like, look, when the president uh, agrees to surveil everyone or go to war or do anything, the yeah. president himself is doing it. And the entire administrative state is unaccountable bureaucrats. And therefore, even though it's all done out in the open <laughs> with <laughs> with regulatory capture, like yeah. whatever few things escape the lobbyist clutches, those are illegal. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> right? Whenever, right. Whenever the lobbyist happens to lose, <laughs> then all bets are off. Uh, it was clearly illegal and done in an unconstitutional way. Right. And I mean, that's how like he he's really I mean, I think he's amusingly savvy in the way he writes his articles because he's like like all conservatives. He's very against uh, regulatory uh, legislative history as providing background 
for mm-hmm. the meaning of statutes because he has the same thing. I think it, I, I think it was you, Michael, who brought this up in an earlier episode that Scalia had like this horrible suspicion that all of legislative history was a psyop um, <laughs> by legislative staffers just sneaking like nefarious information into the congressional record yes. so that judges would refer to it in error. I now also and believe this that. Was, That's true. <laughs> this is a bedrock principle of uh, Scalia's uh, worldview. And so Kavanaugh also. But he also, like, when he's writing about this, he's like, and lobbyists write things into the record. So he's like, yeah, both sides do this. They seed the record, so it's all bullshit. And so the legislative history is not an accurate guide to anything. And if Congress wants it to be a guide, then they should enact it as part of the statute. Like, they should incorporate by reference the legislative committee report that is part of the statute. And if they don't incorporate it by reference, then I'm not going to read it. Right. You know? And so that is his whole, that is his whole background. But you know where he thinks government should have a lot of say in. Good segue. I was about to get there. Take it away, Christina. Yeah. You know, he's one of those guys that wants a government small enough to fit in a woman's uterus. So, uh, of <laughs> course, right. he has a very uh, recent uh, problematic uh, uh, dissent. He wrote the dissent. Yeah, he wrote the dissent on, yeah. um, I, I guess, last year there was a uh, undocumented 17-year-old who was in uh, custody, uh, border, border custody, who uh, was 15 weeks pregnant and wanted to have an abortion. Uh, and he did not want her to have the abortion and basically wrote a very long uh, dissent talking about uh, paying, again, a lot of lip service to precedents while at the same time saying that uh, Roe doesn't apply to undocumented minors. Yeah, I mean, the, the procedural background here is that uh, Gars, uh, wait, is Garza the Texas official? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, no, Garza is the guardian uh, for for uh, the minor who was identified only by her initials. I was like, wait, do I actually have the name of the minor? No, she was no. just Jane Doe. Gar- Gar- no, Garza, uh, yeah, Garza is the guardian for Jane Doe. Um, and they went through the Texas judicial bypass, right? She didn't have a parent or guardian with her. They went through the court in Texas to get authorized uh, for the abortion. And then the government intervened and they said, look, you can't make us complicit in this. You can't make us take her to the, the clinic, the doctor for the abortion. And so they sued to stop it. And you know, she fought that she lost in the fifth circuit. She the one. <laughs> Uh, with yeah. with Henderson and uh, with Henderson and Kavanaugh. Uh, and, oh, I guess it must have been in the D.C. circuit. It was in Texas, but this came before the D.C. circuit on sort of general federal jurisdiction grounds, I guess. So she loses two to one. They take an on banc. And they overrule. Right. And the overruling is like one page. Yeah. They're just like per, <laughs> they're just like per curiam. Uh, give her the abortion. Yeah. Uh, get her out of custody. And give her the abortion. Get her out of custody and give her the abortion. Yeah. And then and right. and one of the panel judges, uh, Judge Millet, writes an opinion in support of it. Judge Henderson writes an opinion like very strongly against it because of the government's interest in fetal health and all of that. And, uh, and probably that an alien in custody doesn't, doesn't have, have a right to this in the first place. Yes. Right. Illegal aliens don't have a right here. And we, sh- that was not properly argued. And we should take that argument more seriously, even though there is specific precedent against it. We, yeah. uh, and then Kavanaugh, writes a kind of middle of the road opinion where he tries to get like what he did in the original opinion was he tried to pave a middle ground where he's like, 
where he's like, take two weeks to find a guardian so someone can counsel this wayward child. <laughs> right. Um, like this, she can't make the opinion on her own. Find someone to that she can confide in who can talk her out of this. Oh, and by the way, what the Bush, what the Trump administration did was literally took her to a crisis pregnancy center Very cool. instead of a clinic. Jesus van. They were Jesus like, van. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so they took her to, we talked about this on episode 17. They took her to a crisis pregnancy center and she's like, so where do I get the abortion? And they said, never baby. <laughs> and, uh, and try to talk Have you her thought out about of it. Jesus, so, yeah. and just, and just and so, FYI, she's 17. Like she's not like a 13 year old or something who like is who she's not a wayward child. I mean, and and more specifically, the you know, he's saying you should get we should take two weeks to get a guardian when she had actually followed the state of Texas's judicial bypass procedure. Right. So the guardian would have no control over her. Well, but not even control. The point is, in a case where you don't have a guardian, state law governs here already. And a judge listened to her, decided she was capable and capable of making the decision, doing it like, you know, with her eyes open and aware, right. like my guess is that the judge also was like, are you sure you want to do this? It's permanent, right? Like all of this yeah. and signed off on it. She right. had an order from a Texas state court judge right. saying that she could go ahead. And he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't care about that. There's got to be someone here. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so he was like, you should have taken two weeks even though that would have pushed her closer to the 20 week point, which would have really jammed her up under Texas law. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're like, look for a guardian for two weeks. And if you don't find one, just come back and I'll find a way to kick it down the road another two weeks. But at least I have two weeks to think (laughs) about a reason to do it. And so, and so he got mad at that. They didn't take his interim way and he got super mad that they even did it on bonk at all. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of his concurring opinion is just about how the DC circuit jerked around with their own on bonk standards just to overrule his decision. (laughs) So with this, with this opinion, I mean, what do you think, what do you guys think this means for like what he's going to do with abortion cases that come up to the Supreme court. Like, do you think that like how hysterical or not hysterical is it that Roe would get thrown out or seriously kneecapped? I I would say I've seen some articles suggest that this would be the blueprint for how he and the Supreme court would gut Roe. And I could see Roberts, you know, going that tack. Paper in, cuts in, yeah. in particular. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think he would be uh, a vote to just straight overturn it. Um, oh, really? Why do, you, why do you say that? Yeah. Well, he's talked before about um, instances when precedents shouldn't be followed. And he described oh. like, you know, it wasn't supportable at the time. It's remained controversial since then. Um, all these things that seem like he's very much hinting at, you know, he doesn't think Roe v. Wade is a precedent that, that should stand. Was this the Rehnquist um, thing? Uh, no, this was a different this was a different thing. But then also he gave a talk on William Rehnquist um, at the uh, American Enterprise Institute. Um about Justice Rehnquist, and in it, he spoke, I thought, rather glowingly about Rehnquist's dissent in Roe v. Wade. Um, You know, and he talked about how Rehnquist, uh, you know, continued to fight that battle after and, like, sort of, you know, succeeded in limiting the right. But, you know, he seemed to be very much in, you know, this was a a worthy crusade that Rehnquist had and one worth taking up. Um, that was my takeaway from it, from the row discussion. Uh, the only, the only thing that I, that I kind of waffle on, on this is I take the general feeling, I take the general position that Rose death will not be by overruling, but instead by paper cuts. I mean, thinking about it this way, right? Gorsuch and Kavanaugh are both Gorsuch and Kavanaugh are both Kennedy clerks and they both like 
love him and he is essentially why they are on the course <laughs> because right. like court because it is just Trump's kissing his ass to get him to retire by promising that he would put his disciples on the court and the law really isn't Roe anymore it's, it's not Casey. the law is Casey right the law is Casey which was a Kennedy slash O'Connor slash Souter decision, right? It was n- authored literally by the three of them officially, right. but it's a Casey decision. It's a Kennedy decision, excuse me. And so Casey is really the law. And the law of Casey is that abortion is legal, but you can definitely put reasonable restrictions on it. Right. And once Casey, once, uh, Casey was the law. Uh, Kennedy found almost every regulation reasonable. Right. Right. Like that was Kennedy's real legacy was that anything that states wanted to do short of outright banning abortion was fine. And so and so parental consent statutes were fine as long as there was judicial bypass, Um, though he, I think, may have even signed on to judicial bypass being unnecessary, but he was in dissent on that. But, but parental consent is fine. I think they did knock out spousal consent because O'Connor was like, you've got to be kidding. (laughs) Like that was like a bridge too far for uh, O'Connor. But like a lot of these rules, even in Casey itself, certain of the restrictions were upheld. Right. And so I think that Kavanaugh and maybe Gorsuch will kind of honor that legacy, but they will honor that legacy by finding every regulation reason. I think, I think like, I don't know true. if they'll go as, I don't think they'll go as far as like, maybe they'll go as far as like states are now introducing like fetal heartbeat and fetal pain and all of right. these things that wind it back to like the sixth week, mm-hmm. which is like an insanely narrow window when you realize that a lot of women don't even realize that they're pregnant right. until they're like three, four, sometimes more weeks in. There's an entire MTV series about <laughs> women just like like having babies that they didn't yeah, even they know like, they, they were like carrying. They out a baby yeah. and they're like, oh no. Yeah. No, right. I thought it was just gas. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I you know, that, that's- and so six weeks is crazy. And six weeks is crazy. And that's what some of the states are trying to pass. And I think they have a strong possibility of passing a Kavanaugh. Yeah, that, that's Gorsuch where I see the problem court. is like, I don't think that like he, he would straight up like gut row, but I think what's going to happen is now states are going to be so emboldened to pass some just wild bullshit. And I think it's all going to get upheld. And I don't think there's anything yep. that the three liberal justices can do about it. And so, you know, if you're a woman listening to this, get your IUD now. Like, it's not going to be a very fun, like, next 15 years for the right. It depends on what state you're in. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But even like. How much money you have. Yeah. But even, but even like, even state by state is going to be weird because it is going to be like, there are probably states that still have statutes on the books. I think New York may have been like one of the first ones, even before Roe to have passed a statute permitting abortion. But like even our state legislature is kind of like weirdly razor thin. And so I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know that women, even in like deep blue States should be too comfortable like with this. It's like, it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, shit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. RBG, Um, please, please don't die. Just. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep, that's it. We're time time have... to pack the courts. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Well, not, not yet. <laughs> yeah, not yet, man. <laughs> no, you're about, not yet, not yet man. Dark, dark six dark years too early. Yeah. Judge, <laughs> Judges Piero and Napolitano, the 10th and 11th justices. <laughs> uh, though I think Napolitano would never get nominated because he's turned on Trump on some of the Russia stuff. Right. So. Um, but in any event, yeah. Uh, any other... Any other uh, areas of Kavanaugh 
He's real ugly. Uh, we have He's- <laughs> <laughs> I did I did want to go through one decision only because I remember it coming up in law school and um this was on um Obamacare. Um, oh right. And uh because I when he first got nominated just recently I I, I my recollection was, oh, this guy is conservative, but I kind of remember him having a reputation for being a bit of an honest broker. And and that the seed of that was this uh, Obamacare decision. And so uh, to set it up very quickly um, for lay listeners, uh, when Congress passes laws, it has a list of enumerated powers and it has to sort of attach one of those powers to the law and say, you know, we're exercising this power uh, and their broadest power is to regulate interstate commerce. And so the healthcare law is justified under that power. Um, and, and that's what it's challenged under. The question is whether or not it goes beyond, you know, pre-existing limits uh, of the commerce power. Um, and so Kavanaugh wrote this, this decision um, before it went up to the Supreme Court where he basically said, you know, we should be very cautious um, in my mind, this is uh, for the purposes of this law called the Anti-Injunction Act. This is a tax. And the Anti-Injunction Act says uh, you can't challenge a tax until it's actually levied. And since, you know, this is 2013 or 2014. Um, you and know, the tax here is the individual mandate. Right. The penalty you'd pay for it under right. the individual mandate. And, uh, you know, since that hasn't gone into force yet uh, and it's never been levied, we should honor the Anti-Injunction Act and not even consider this. And then he goes on to, to sort of say, that being said, if we were to reach the merits, let's be honest, it really looks like a tax. Like, you know, there if there's any issue with it, it's very slight. Uh, you know, and, and this is something I can imagine a, a liberal reading and being like, wow, this guy seems to be cutting against his partisan biases. And it seems very honest and, and all that, um, you know, and ultimately Supreme Court upheld it as a tax. Uh, but then he kind of gives away the game at the end when he's he goes in and is basically like, hey, fellow conservatives, <laughs> we should be really careful about saying this is unconstitutional because this could be the sort of uh, thin edge of the wedge for privatizing the entire social secu- social safety net. Like this is this is the model, right? This is this is what it looks like. And he, he says this, uh, the leading edge of a shift in how the federal government goes about furnishing a social safety net. The private entities will do better than government providing certain social insurance that mandates will work better than the traditional regulatory taxes. Um, Privatized social services are better than, you know, tax and spend federal government. And so he's basically like, hey, think a little bit beyond the, you know, the name on the law on the next six months. If we want to privatize social security, if we want to privatize Medicare, maybe we shouldn't be saying these schemes are <laughs> unconstitutional. And, and <laughs> Take it the long uh, view. <laughs> right? It's like, it's, it's kind of, it's wild. When I read it, I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. I get where this guy's coming from. Uh, yeah. He's a partisan hack, even when he seems like he's, he's being a fair broker. That's funny. That's like, because yeah. I always, I always think of the, uh, I always think of the Obamacare decision as being like the Roberts poison pill decision right. where he was, where he's like, look, it's true. This is definitely a tax. Right. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but it's a tax. It's a tax. It's a tax. <laughs> right. right. Like, there tax. Was, like, yeah. yeah, like that's it. You get like the a friend of mine was like, but wait, didn't Obama say it wasn't a tax? I was like, yeah, that's what he said to you. Right. But when he when he actually had to write a legal brief on it, <laughs> yeah. he's like, uh, this is valid under the taxing power. And uh, and that's, you know, you want to make a political argument, make a political argument. Right. When George Bush said, read my lips, no new taxes, you're allowed to vote him out of office because it was bullshit. <laughs> right. Right. Just because you called it fees for your entire presidency. But it like it remains like a tax in the way we normally think of it. So it's a political question, but as a legal question, the individual mandate is definitely a tax. <laughs> right. And so whatever, easy. But I didn't. And so his poison pill was then to introduce federalism concerns and knock out the like all of the states from uh, 
like the the Medicare expansion, the, right. the coercive the coercive budgetary attachment to the Medicare expansion. He made right. un, he made unconstitutional, and so that's why all of the Republican governors started opting out when they found they could. Right. Um, but that so that I thought that was the poison pill. I didn't realize that Kavanaugh had put in a second poison pill <laughs> right. where the where the taxing authority is the philosophical ground for privatizing the entire uh government benefit structure. Right. Yeah. Uh which they also do, by the way. Like now all sorts of like public assistance. Like mm-hmm. you see people with debit cards like it used to right. be it used to be just like EBT cards and stuff. And now all of this shit is on debit cards through banks that charge management yep. fees, which right. cuts which cuts public benefits even further right. because they have introduced an intermediary taking a VIG, which is right. a beautiful future. Um, ugh. Well, I think he's going to be great. <laughs> Yeah, as, yeah. as um, someone who has worked in giant insurance companies for a long time, it's amazing to me the faith these guys have uh, that there's any efficiencies <laughs> to be found in these fucking bloated behemoths. <laughs> um, yeah. You've seen my Twitter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, all right. So now I have a question. I think that's the last uh, we're going to do on Kavanaugh. And so now my question to everyone before I move on is that we are at about an hour 15 Mm -hmm. and I don't think any of us really care that much about the Russia indictments. Mm -hmm. And I think we can just end here and just do Kavanaugh. Indict him. I barely know him. (laughs) Indict him. All right. Sorry. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, we'll just cut out this little thing and I'm going to just close Kavanaugh and then sign off. Tight, All right. Tight episode. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, so I think that's it. Does anyone have anything else bad to say about Brett Kavanaugh? Well, he's better than Harry Myers. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I don't know. Well, I, know. I mean, it depends. It depends. I mean, he's smarter than Harriet Myers. Right. But Harriet Myers might have ended up being like a suitor type. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I don't know. I've I've read I've read I've read certain analyses of his decisions that suggest he may be to the left of Bork. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Wait, that's a that is that is a negative thing. Couch is a positive Uh, thing. And I will Um, (laughs) will say this. So this is a prediction more so than an observation, which is. some of you will live uh, to see the day where he's the moderate uh, on the court. Oh, oh Jesus. Jesus. God. Oh, God. <laughs> that is even more depressing that, than I was going to say. Don't put that Here on is me. I- here is, well, I'm 25. Yeah, well, well, when you're 45, that shit to yourself, uh, you're going to be hoping man. that guy, you know, <laughs> votes to allow, uh, you know, disabled people to live uh, in uh, a court. <laughs> Um, the, the one thing I will say in reading his opinions and articles is that I think you are going to find that he is at least as cloying and annoying a writer as Gorsuch is. That's like seems the, impossible. But. The, we are, we are now in the generation of boomer writer, like, you know, baby boomer justices writing super tedious garbage. And so like Gorsuch (laughs) and like reading Kavanaugh, I'm like, Oh my God, it's the same. It's the same thing who he grew up humor adjacent (laughs) and, and just barely missed what it was about. It's going to be a lot of rhetorical (laughs) questions. He got, he got close. Yeah. He got close enough to it to like, be considered clever by his not clever peers. And so he's going to just subject us to his horrible half-ass joking for the next 30 years. I, I, I tried to get through that AEI speech he gave. Um, and this is an unctuous nerd uh, who, whose first yeah. <laughs> hero was fucking William Rehnquist. <laughs> you know. Yes. Infamous segregationist, yeah. <laughs> William <Yes. Reckless. laughs> Like, I, I will also say, Tark, I got five minutes into it, and then I was like, "There's got to be a fucking transcript somewhere. I can't listen to this guy." I read, I read, I read <laughs> the, I read the, 
I read the, the prepared the marks. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, no, I read I read a few of his articles, and I just was like, "Look, I am not by any stretch of the imagination a tough guy." And man, there's God. If I run into you near a locker, you're going in it, Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> <laughs> you are, you are, I don't care how small that locker is. You're going to fit. Um, Get his ass. And so, yeah, it's going to be rough. It's going to be rough listening to these two people try to really uh, make like witty opinions uh, that are proto fascist. Um, so that's great. All right. End it on a high note. Um, <laughs> with that, I am going to say thank you, uh, to my panel, uh, Tarek, uh, Mr. Lather, uh, Christina and Michael. Uh, I am Charles Starr saying good night from Mike Dicta. Uh, thank you all for listening. See you later. Good night, everybody. All right. All right. So, uh, let us hit stop. Yeah.